Welcome to the Motivational Midwife. My name's Lynn Jones, and today we're going to be looking at abdominal examination. So let's look at abdominal examination. And as always, we'll start with why. So it's generally used to assess fetal growth and highlight deviations from norm. So is that baby growing as we would expect it to be growing? Um, and do we need to refer? It's also used to determine fetal position, engagement, um, later in the pregnancy and certainly in labour and we need to assess the position in order that we can aus auscultate the fetal heart um, appropriately. Um, and when do we undertake it? Well certainly measuring we don't uh, generally in line with nice current NICE guidance we don't usually undertake before 24 weeks and latterly in the pregnancy we're looking um, at determining the fetal presentation and position any admission to hospital as part of your holistic uh, assessment of the woman in labour, prior to auscultation, prior to a vaginal examination, because remember that your vaginal examination really is determining and confirming your abdominal findings. Prior to any invasive procedures such as amniocentesis and also prior to external cephalic version, so turning the baby from a breech to a head down position. And that's because it may well have already turned itself. Um, and you, although you're as a midwife are not going to be undertaking those procedures, you may well be supporting the women um, who are having those procedures. So we need to gain consent as always. And in these instances, it's usually verbal or implied. We need to explain why we want to undertake that uh, abdominal examination and be mindful of maintaining dignity and privacy and that different cultures uh, may have. Um, may be uh, less happy about exposing um, bare flesh um, in areas outside their home. So just be mindful that you um, have that sheets and things that you can maintain their dignity and privacy and only expose what you need to expose to undertake the examination. So abdominal examination, we all get very hung up on, on it being um, abdominal palpation, but it is much more than just palpation. And there are four parts to the abdominal examination. And a student I taught many years ago coined the acronym IPAD, which is quite a good way of, of remembering it. So there's the inspection part, the palpation part, auscultation of the fetal heart, and then documentation of your findings, but also discussion of your findings with the woman. So looking at inspection first, you're looking at the size and shape of the abdomen. Is it roughly where you would expect it to be for um, the number of weeks pregnant she is? Um, is there any uh, skin changes um, there? I mean, historically, we used to, in terms of shape and size, we used to actually use landmarks on the abdomen um, to determine roughly where we would expect that baby to be at any given point or the uterus to be at any given point during the pregnancy. So pre-12 weeks, it would still be behind the symphysis pubis. You wouldn't be able to palpate it at all. By about 24 weeks, it was roughly umbilicus. And by about 36 weeks, it would be about around the zivi sternum. Not a hugely accurate way of determining um, fetal growth at all uh, because women vary quite widely in shape and size. And it's been superseded now by uh, synthesis fundal height measurements. But it's still useful to know those landmarks and it gives you a rough ballpark figure. Um, with the skin changes, you're expecting changes to the skin during pregnancy, particularly pigmentation changes. And you will often see the linear negra, which you can see in that bottom picture. It's much more apparent 
on um, darker skins than paler skins. Um, and uh, your striae uh, on their stretch marks, uh, when they first appear, they, they're very red, they're very uh, angry looking. Um, and they can be quite distressing for some women as well. Uh, they're never ever going to go away. You're going to have to reassure the women that they will fade and become quite silvery, but they, they're never going to disappear no matter uh, what lovely lotions and potions that are on the market um, report to be able to achieve. And later in pregnancy, you may see fetal movements. Um, it's also useful to look at the the abdomen and see is there any evidence of previous surgery so has she had a previous cesarean section is there appendicectomy scars um, scars that can be missed quite easily are um, a small scar around about the umbilicus and then just above the symphysis pubis and that would indicate that she's had some sort of laparoscopic surgery and um, so it's worth investigating what that is because it could have um, implications for labour. So moving on to palpation, okay, which is where most people get really hung up about um, and consider the examination really to be all about palpation. And palpation does glean a lot of information, but it's not the only part of the examination. So uh, as I said, historically, we used to really just um, gauge the growth of the baby uh, manually. And I would still say it is very useful to hone the tools of your trade, so your hands, your your senses, um, because very often you can have um, a woman who measures within the normal parameters, but when you palpate, you feel that this baby palpates as a very small baby or a, a bigger than anticipated baby, and you should trust your clinical judgment in referring those women. Um, so Synthesis Fundal Height, Perinatal Institute um, developed a uh, GROW program, so the GAP scan program, and many trusts are now signed up to this program. And it's really to highlight those small for gestational age babies, babies that are growth restricted. Um, and ideally, women should have a customised growth chart. So the customised growth charts are generated using with specific software. Um, but they use uh, the women's ethnicity, um, weight, height, uh, BMI and previous births to generate a customised growth chart, which will give a trajectory of growth for her specific uh, pregnancy, as opposed to a generic growth chart. Um, it's measured in centimetres. Um, you measure using a tape measure that won't stretch. So you, most places use a paper tape measure and they measure from the fundus to the upper border of the symphysis pubis. So this top bit here is where you want the end of the tape to be. Your tape measure should be face down so that you're not getting any operator bias and you measure once. And roughly um, she will be about the same number of centimetres as gestation. Um, so, for example, if she was 28 weeks pregnant, she's going to be round about 20 centi 28 centimetres, give or take two or three centimetres either way. But it tends to need to follow her pattern. So from that first movement, uh, first measurement, if she was um, 28 weeks pregnant, but she was measuring 26, so two centimetres below, she'll always measure two centimetres below. She'll follow her own trajectory uh, and that would be a normal growth pattern for her and if she veered either above or below that it would trigger you to um, refer. So we're um, also as part of our palpation looking for the lie of the baby and the lie is the long, uh, long axis of the baby so this bit in relation to the long axis of the uterus so the lie will either be a longitudinal lie an oblique lie or a transverse lie. We're also looking at the presentation. So is it phallic? Is it head? Is it breech or bottom? Or if it's transverse, it will be shoulder. And the position of the baby. So the position of the baby, really anterior positions favour um, a more flexed, they promote a more flexed um, attitude for the baby. Um, so the baby will either be anterior so it'll either be a, a right anterior or a left anterior, 
a lateral, so right or left lateral, or a posterior. My hands are in the way, so right or left posterior. Okay, um, and the attitude, attitude is really the relationship of the fetal head and limbs um, to the body. So what we ideally want is a really nicely flexed baby because that's going to give us the smallest diameters going through that pelvis. So you will either have a nicely flexed baby, you will have a deflexed baby, or you will have, uh, certainly in the case of a face presentation, uh, an extended uh, baby. Um, and then we are looking at the engagement. So when we're thinking about engagement, we're looking at the um, transverse diameter of the fetal skull. So your biparietal diameter here, which is 9.5 centimetres, going through the brim of the pelvis. So when that widest bit has gone through the, the brim of the pelvis, okay, that's said to be engaged. And the denominator, this is a fixed point on your um, presenting part. So if it's the um, head, it's your occiput. If it's the sac uh, bottom, it's the sacrum. And if it's a face presentation, it's the chin, which is the mentum. OK, so when you're looking at position of baby, you will very often say if it's an anterior position and it's head down, um, it might be left occipito anterior okay um, and if it's uh, a posterior position potentially we might have left occipito posterior or left occipito lateral okay or you could have right as well um, in determining palpation as well when we're palpating that's further split into three elements you've got your fundal palpation where you're locating the fundus lateral palpation so where you're actually um, determining which side the the fetal back is on and then your pelvic palpation where you're determining um, the presenting part and the um, position and engagement Okay. There is, uh, and historically we've kind of done it in that order, um, although there is a school of thought that suggests that the um, abdominal muscles, once you, you start uh, touching them, become a little bit more tense, which can make pelvic palpation a little bit more difficult. Um, so some schools of thought say it may be useful to start with the pelvic palpation and, and almost work backwards. With pelvic palpation, you, you may well see two different methods. You're encouraged to use the two-handed um, technique uh, and sometimes maybe get the women to slightly bend their legs um, as this will help um, make it slightly more comfortable but also make it easier for you um, to, to determine what you're feeling. Um, but you may also see a one-handed technique called Paulick's manoeuvre but it's much more uncomfortable for the women. So then the third part of our abdominal examination is auscultation, so where we are listening to the fetal heart. Remember antenatally, this is a bit of a snapshot in time. Fetal movements are by far a better indicator of the well-being of the um, baby. But we will listen. Gold standard is with a pinard stethoscope before any sort of electronic um, method of auscultating. And so your pinard stethoscope, um, you would auscultate once you've located the fetal back ideally you're going to locate um, your pinards over that fetal back um, and auscultate if it's a direct um, posterior position then very often you're you're hearing it more uh, centrally and more towards the sort of umbilicus you're often hearing it there um, and if it's breech it's often around the umbilical area that you're hearing it as well um, so you listen for a full minute you're listening to see how regular that is, uh, what your baseline rate is. So is it sitting within um, the rate that you would expect it to be sitting at, particularly for its gestation as well? Are you hearing any extra beats that you might need to refer her in for further investigation? Is there evidence of accelerations or decelerations more concerningly? And then documentation. So as I've said, discussion with the, the woman of your findings um, 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 
also write your plan of care. So either when her next appointment is or if you've had to refer her for any reason, what that plan of care is. But in line with your NMC documentation from uh, in relation to the code of conduct and also the um, standards for uh, competence for midwives, proficiencies and competence for midwives, um, your documentation needs to be contemporaneous. It needs to be dated, signed, uh, your uh, name printed as well, so it's legible, and also um, your designation as well. And remember, if you are a student midwife and you are writing uh, anything, you must ensure that your um, supervisor, the midwife you are working with, countersigns your entries, be they electronic or um, paper. Uh, manual uh, documentation, you must ensure that they have read your documentation and that they countersign it because ultimately they are responsible for what you are writing. Um, be mindful of data protection as well, so how that uh, information that you have written is going to be secured um, and uh, who needs to know about it, if any anyone. And there you have it, abdominal examination. I hope you found that useful. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do. And I look forward to seeing you next time.